Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us today. We pray that the Lord is doing great and mighty things in your life, and we are excited about what the Lord is doing in our life and in your life and the lives of your loved ones. And we just pray that whatever situation you find yourself in today, that you are trusting the Lord. And we are praying for you. We might not know you. We may have never met. We may never meet this side of heaven, but... If you're God's child, we're praying for you. And if you're not, we're praying that you will just come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and allow him to just be your best friend. Because I'm telling you, he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And if you've been listening to this program and it's been a blessing to you, we'd love to hear from you. And you can contact me at Ministries at AOL.com. Or you can find us on Facebook by searching for Defining Moments with, um, well, you know, that is our YouTube address. I'm going to go ahead and give you that one, too. It's Defining Moments with Evangelist Lynn Taylor. But also, you can find us on Facebook at Defining Moments Ministries. And we would love for you to connect with us there and just get to know us and let us get to know you and see what the Lord is doing in your life. And with all that said, we just once again want to welcome you and ask you to just be in prayer for us as we go about doing what the Lord has called and commissioned us to do as we reach out to reach the lost. Because, you know, none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. You heard me make one just a moment ago. But you know what? It's okay. We're just human. And God takes our imperfections and He is glorified through them. And I'm so thankful that He is not looking for ability, but He's looking for availability. If you'll make yourself available to Him, He will definitely show up and do something in your life. And today I am blessed and honored to have my guest with us today. And you know, she has a very unique story a very powerful and incredible story uh, i've told her on uh, different occasions when she shared some things with me that you know what that almost sounds unbelievable some of the things that she has experienced in her life and so with that said i just want to uh put a little advice out for you this morning that if there are young children in the room that are going to be here in this program today you you might want to try, try to uh, find us on YouTube and listen to this at a later time when you are not with children. We don't uh, have to say this many times, but once in a while we have a testimony that's very intense and full of a lot of things that might not be appropriate for young children to hear. So we just want to let you know that there will probably be some things shared today that might not be for little ears and we want you to be able to keep your children uh, from maybe hearing some of the things that we're going to share and talk about today but you know it's not going to be any bad language or any bad thing like that just some stories and incidences that happen that might be a little traumatic for little ears to hear so we just wanted to let you know that this morning and with that said I want to welcome my guest this morning and we're going to call her Sarah Jingles today and my granddaughter asked why is her last name Jingles and I told her I said because she wears lots of jewelry and she <laughs> jingles and she thought that was rather funny and then today she shows up for this program with no jewelry on and so <laughs> my granddaughter looked at me a little strange but you know we just want to do all we can to protect our guests and to uh, bring this word to you because we know that the Lord has a great great move of his spirit for you today so wherever you are and whatever you're doing we invite you to spend the next few moments with us as miss sarah comes and shares her story with us today so sarah thank you for coming and welcome to defining moments this morning well thank you for inviting me i'm very glad to be here today i want to um share some things that i have been through but i first want to quote something before i get started in my story in the beginning, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God is moving upon the face of your situation to bring forth his light. 
Why? Because God's best work started from a dark place. Neither you nor I will live a trouble-free life. Scripture does not say if you have trouble. It says when you have trouble. God says take courage that he will get us through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. Your mess can be your message. Your history can be his story. You can lose everything with one exception, your destiny and God's love for you. You will never lose that. Your troubles will eventually pass. God will make something good out of it. I used to always say, this too shall pass, and eventually it would. You hear that God doesn't take you through more than what you can bear. I'm a living testimony that he can take you through a whole lot more than you ever thought you could handle. I'm going to begin with my daddy buying a household development three hours from where we lived. Until we moved up there, we took this three-hour drive on weekends, holidays, and the summer. We always passed this one particular place that had a house and a barn with a lot of land around it. No neighbors. We had to go a half hour north, south, east, or west to see a light or stop sign, and I was a city girl. After we moved up there, I had a blind date. After a while, he took me to meet his parents. Guess what? We went to the place where I'd always wondered about. People told me that if I hadn't wondered about that place all the time, I might not have ended up there. (laughs) That family almost destroyed me. They were an instrument of the devil to steal, kill, and destroy me. For five years before I got married, my dad was running around on my mom. There was constant fighting. I was the oldest and had to help get my three brothers through all that was going on. My dad eventually left my mom and married the woman. Because of all this, I was so happy to be getting married and be getting out of this mess and to be with this wonderful family. I took all the cruelty they dished out for a year. One day I had it and said what I thought. They said if I didn't like the way they ran things, they would kick my blank so damn high that it never would touch ground. My mother-in-law was pulling my hair, and my father-in-law came after me with a knife. My husband had to stop him. They had a 10,000-acre ranch. We lived in a trailer next to them. My husband worked for them. We moved to a shack that was all we could afford. My husband still worked for them. Of course, we hoped to be able to inherit the land and the money and everything one day. A few years later, they built a new house and gave us their old house. His family got mad with me and came after me while I was about 19 days pregnant when the heart would have been forming. My son was born with twisted backward arteries and twisted backward heart chambers. We tried to leave several times, but no one would hire my husband as his dad was a powerful political figure for 25 years, and his dad had been that for 25 years before. So the family was well known in several counties and no one wanted to get involved by hiring him. When my son was 10 months old, he had to have open heart surgery. They sent us to a famous doctor in another state. He was there for six weeks before he died. The autopsy showed that the doctor had left a foreign object in his heart that went to the back of his brain and it blinded him and killed him. Those six weeks were a horrible ordeal, but God took care of us. We found a house to rent, churches prayed for us, brought us food, took care of us. The beautician did my hair for free each week. I told her I had to fly up there suddenly and had no curlers. Nurses took the kids, 10 and 12, to the zoo and other places. I had tremendous faith that he would live. I helped all the other families with what they were going through. I had the peace that passes all understanding. When he died, I felt God could have prevented it. That's what destroyed me. I taught Sunday school, vacation Bible school, child evangelism for years. I left God for three years after this. I thought, what is the use of praying? God is going to do what he wants to do. My husband and children wanted to go to church. My husband had had an awesome experience at the hospital. On July 4th, the hospital called and said my son's eyes were being ate out by a staph infection. Mm -hmm. They said if they didn't get a transplant, they would be empty sockets. Mm -hmm. He was able to get the transplant. Our preacher was up from Florida. I was in the shower. He took my husband and was going to come back after me. 
While in the ICU waiting room, my husband heard heavenly music, saw bright lights, was lifted up, and felt that God told him that your son is going to be all right. When he died, I thought that would devastate him. It didn't because of that experience. When my son went to heaven, he was all right. I worked at a nursing home. Several of the employees kept asking me to go to their church. They went to the same church. To get them off my back, I went. The songs were getting to me, and I told God under my breath that you are nothing but a mean, cruel God, and I will not let these songs get to me. The grief books say God can handle what you say when you are grieving. Someone spoke in tongues, and the interpretation was that I am not the mean, cruel God that you say that I am. I could not believe with all the people in the world he heard me. I immediately got back into church. Those three years were miserable years without God. I'll never know why he was taken, but it has made me a more compassionate person. I start a compassionate friends group to help others. If you've lost a child, find a compassionate friends group or a grief group at a church. You go through five stages of grief, and you need help getting through them. There's a high divorce rate because the spouses have trouble helping each other out. Another time, my husband's family got mad with me. They were all after me. Our St. Bernard dog bit the sister. We left. Couldn't find a job. My mother went to go get us some more clothes. She took a deputy with her. They found all my clothes in the yard with acid poured all over them. They found our dog with his head cut off. That still affects my son. I went to a Monday night church service, and they said I had to forgive. I thought that meant I had to go back, so we did. Another time we left, and my husband's mother said she only had six months to live, that she had cancer. She lied. She lived another 33 years. My husband was a great husband, or I wouldn't have stayed. He was a great dad. He was greatly loved by everyone. He was just born into the wrong family. Psychiatrist said I would have had to have seen how he was treated growing up, that he was not able to defend himself. When he died, 400 people showed up to his funeral, even though we'd been gone 11 years. After all that I've just said that we went through, my husband's father decides to go into the drug smuggling business. The sheriff and other ranchers were doing it. He had my husband and his brother put out landing lights on the landing strip out back. You would have thought he might have thought I might end up in jail or my son's. He already had millions in the bank. He didn't use my husband at first because we had children. He used his brother who got caught. He got only community service, so then he concentrated on my husband. You did whatever his dad said or got beat with cow whips. My husband has showed a DEA agent the strip out back the DEA agent's plane crashed after he left the local airport. The newspaper said he was a DEA agent, so we never spoke to him again. A few months later, I had the SWAT team, like you see on TV, made up of 25 agents burst into my house after my kids caught the school bus. They threw me in the yard in front of everyone. I was in my nightgown. They were there to arrest my husband. Local television stations were there. We made local and national TV. My husband was out back cow hunting. We had semis there to take the calves to the market. They pulled guns out on the drivers. There were 19 arrested. The rest just had two agents go up to their house. We only knew two of the 19. My daughter turned 15 that day. I was supposed to go in and get her learner's permit. She got scared when men answered the phone said her mother wasn't there. Someone from the school took her home. She saw all the men with guns and asked, where is her daddy and mama? They stuck a gun in her stomach and said, go ask your mama. What you don't know is that conspiracy lasts five years, so everything those 19 did for five years we were guilty of. While waiting for this trial to start, they even put out an all-points bulletin that they could shoot us or my kids. The trial lasted six weeks. The judge decided it was a different conspiracy and let my husband go. My husband quit and never did it again. His dad had his brother do it. You would have thought that he would have said, it's not worth the risk. 
He only made 10000 a deal and only did it a few times a year. He did not sell the drugs. The dad finally dies. We finally think we're going to have a good life. The, get the land, the millions, and the cows. No more being abused. One month after the dad dies, the government comes in and seizes our houses and the land. Again, we had the SWAT teams, TV cameras again, local national news. They had army ducks all over the place looking for pieces of crashed airplanes. There were none. Yellow tape all around the highway. We lived on a four-lane highway, so everyone is stopping and looking. They had evidence on my father-in-law for 12 years. They waited for him to die because of his political power. Our lawyer said you can't take a dead man's property. That is unconstitutional. The judge said to get another defense. It took two years for that trial to start, so our lives were in limbo for two years. Prosecutor did something wrong. A mistrial was declared. A new jury was to be picked. The government says if you give us 1,500 acres of land, we will never bother you again. The lawyers agreed. My mother-in-law gave them land that my husband and his brother inherited. She later sold the whole ranch and just kept 500 acres. It's amazing how God brought me through all this, the abuse from the family, the sick son, his dying, and then three trials. I had to raise my kids with all this going on, wondering if we would lose our house or land. My husband was deeply depressed. There's still a lot more that I had to bear year after year. Many a time I wanted to commit suicide to keep from waking up to grief. Only God kept me from taking my life or ending up in a mental institution. I would have never made it without God. Next week I will share how he made the agreement with the Southern District of Florida and how the next day the Middle District of Florida came out and arrested everyone and re-seized everything. They had to have already planned that. As I end, I want to bring up a point I discussed earlier. When my husband was first arrested, he was charged with five years even though he only did one act. A drug conspiracy is five years long and you are responsible for everything the other members that you are working with have done for five years. My husband only knew two out of 19 people. I went to four different prisons for visitation every weekend for three years. It's so sad to see grandkids gathered around granddaddy, kids gathered around their daddy. These families all look like a family you would see in a church. Judges can no longer give a fair sentence. They have to do what is mandatory sentencing, which means most time is life. Please be careful. Young kids and adults both. You can be hanging out with the wrong crowd. You might not be doing anything, but your friends could say you are. They use a lot of hearsay that they don't have to prove. If you are in a car that is stopped and drugs are found, you are guilty too, even if you say they are not your drugs. Your friends might say they are. I saw so many young kids go in for life. Remember, it's not worth whatever money you make. Also, I shared how I had the peace that passes all understanding. That's because I was constantly hooked up to God, praying every day and night. When life gets great, you don't take the time to pray like you do when you are facing troubling circumstances. It's a pain that hooks you up to God. God's love is so strong for you when you are in pain. This keeps you close to him. This is a refining process. It's an occasion for growth, so welcome the pain. Wow. You know, you're just listening at that. I know that <clears throat> during a lot of that, I can, I can only imagine going home to get your stuff to find your dog laying there and somebody's decapitated him. I mean, we love our animals. Sometimes they're like our children, you know, and you go home and and that has happened and then there's so many things that you had to deal with and watch your spouse be mistreated and you know you and I were talking about people would say well if it was that bad why did she stay or why did she go back and your answer to that was 
You loved your husband. Yes, I loved him very much. He's a very good person. He was just just born into the wrong family because he was he was great. Everybody loved him. He didn't have a enemy mm-hmm. anywhere, and um, just a you know. And he'd had encephalitis, which left his nerves dangling mm-hmm. and migraine headaches every day. And so the doctor said he wasn't even supposed to be under any stress. And then all of his life he'd been beat with cow whips and cussed. Mm-hmm. Even when I was married to him, cussed all the time. So he couldn't stand up for himself or us, mm-hmm. you know. And like the psychiatrist told you, you would have had to put yourself in his shoes growing up the way he did in order to understand why he couldn't. It's so easy sometimes to stand on the outside and look at a situation and say what you would or wouldn't do. Well, I would never stay in that. I would never go back or I would never this or that. But you got to look into the heart of the person that's dealing with that and what they have endured even back in his childhood where you didn't know him and you know and going through the grief of what you encountered with your son you were the strong christian woman that you know was really into the lord and teaching the kids and the bible school and and all that and then you lost faith you know you what was it you said god was mean and cruel (laughs) the songs were getting to me and tears were coming out of the side of my eyes so i told god you're nothing but a mean cruel god Mm -hmm. and i will not let these songs get to me now i was a baptist Mm -hmm. and these friends of mine were pentecostals so i'd never heard anybody speak in tongues Uh before and to know that he said exactly what i said back to me word for word he, he hears it all, doesn't he? He does. And he can really shock us. But and, and there was your husband that had grown up in this atmosphere with all this abuse and all this uh, just controlling person in his life. But yet he hears God say, your son's going to be okay. But then he dies. Mm-hmm. And how old was this child? He was... Um two weeks short of his first birthday. Wow. That, I, I can't imagine going through that grief and that sorrow. And you shared something with me. I want to touch on quickly before we go off the air. But something you shared with me earlier was about attending a class where a lady had you draw something. Right. And, and what she told you she saw in interpreting that drawing. Share that um, okay. today with us. This was um, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and she was part of Who Started Hospice, and I went to a grief meeting, and so she just put crayons in front of us and a sheet of paper and said to draw a picture. Well, I drew a black boat with a strong red anchor in a choppy sea and a black chart (laughs) so she said that I was anchored in my grief and extremely mad with God. You know, I was just drawing a picture. I didn't know what I was drawing. I just got the crayons and was drawing. But that, she knows how to interpret pictures and says if they could even get in the schools with five and six year olds, that you can interpret the pictures that they draw. Wow, and that's amazing because she pegged you on that. Right. <laughs> that you were stuck in that grief. But you know, I'm sure it's an easy place to get stuck because you're dealing with all those emotions. I mean, even to the point that you were contemplating suicide because that you felt that was your only way out right. and then in the midst of all this you've got God saying you've got to forgive right. you have to forgive these people for cutting your dog's head off you have to forgive uh, the doctor who left a foreign object in your baby and resulted in his death you have to forgive your husband for not being what some people would look at and say a quote unquote man and standing up to his family for you but it like i said goes back to that it's so easy to look in and see that and say if that was me i would do this or i would do that but until you're in those shoes you really don't know what you would do yeah you don't you don't have a clue what you would do that is not how you thought your marriage would be no or how your (laughs) life would be but Mm -hmm. god that's right he's the game changer he's the one that i know you give him all the glory for bringing you through all these things and i know you've been through some 
uh, deliverances in your life and you've been with some people that have prayed with you and the Lord has just been faithful and brought you through that and given you the grace and and he's still giving you grace and you're still blessing people I know we're still we still go through things we will until Jesus comes or we go by the way of the grave but you're being such a blessing today just to come because you know this is like a storybook to me everything everything you tell me and every time you tell me something new and I just you've got to write that book you've got to write that book and I'm thinking this is a really good place to start as I was looking over some of this and there's just so much that has happened in your life that anybody could look at that and and see or hear your story and know that God is faithful right that he is faithful and he is just and 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 you know he rewards the wicked too right you know and it's like you hear people say well well their day's coming or or something happened and we may not know but god knows and that's true which we pray for god to be merciful Mm -hmm. and and give that person the opportunity to repent but once they harden their heart then they kind of seal their own doom have people say how can a good god send people to hell well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. He right. prepared the way that no one would have to suffer or perish. But we, when we reject him and we choose to walk in our own way, we, in essence, send ourselves to hell. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just I just know that it's a blessing for you to be here and to share this with us. Do you have anything else you want to add to that before we go off the air, Sarah? Um, just next week I'm going to be finishing up because that's only touched on part of what I've been Mm -hmm. through and even what I'm going to include next week is still only part of what I've been through it would probably take me a full year to explain everything but um and then my my mother-in-law like she was um saying she really believed she was saved and she really believed she was going to sit next to Jesus and she really believed God was telling her to do everything that she did that's so it's hard to get through mm-hmm. to someone like that because they don't feel like they need to say I'm sorry or oh, ask oh, God's yeah. forgiveness or anything because she she felt she's carrying through exactly what God would want done. Well, and we're going to hear some more of that next week. So let us just invite you again to, to tune in again next week and uh, just to be praying and you know if there's anybody in this situation similar to what she has talked about today invite them to join us next Sunday morning and remember this that out of everything you've heard us say here today when you realize just how much Jesus Christ loves you and you surrender your life to him then you will experience your greatest defining moment <music>